Yay, thanks for coming. So first, I just want to thank the organizers. Um, I'm really honored to be on stage at such an amazing conference. It's been a real pleasure. And also, I just want to thank the um, diversity scholarship sponsors. I actually came here last year on a diversity scholarship. So it means, um, yeah, it means a lot to me that I'm on stage now. So yeah, thank you, everyone involved. You guys did great. <laughs> Yay. Diversity claps. OK. So hi, my name's Abby. Um, I actually did not change my name to get my job. <laughs> I don't know if you saw, yeah, Adeline's um, talk yesterday. That was amazing. I have a newfound respect for the power of my name and the privilege I've been given. So <laughs> that was, yeah, that blew me away. But um, yeah, I work for Mozilla, and I want, no, I use the web to move science forward. I actually just changed that. It used to say I want to use the web to move science forward. But I realized this whole talk is me inviting you to join me. So I should probably say that I, I am doing that now. So yes, please join me. And that's what I will talk about for the next 40 minutes. So I work at Mozilla. And we're building a better internet, promoting openness, innovation, and opportunity on the web. And I came to Mozilla because I was really interested in how they were applying this mission to a very specific um, area of practice with science. And they have a lot of really interesting problems in science. So here's a quiz. Who can tell me what's the similar between these two problems? Sony PSP video game graphics and de novo sequence assembly. Any ideas? Yeah. Absolutely parallel. parallel. Actually, yeah, that's, that is true. I wasn't thinking of that. <laughs> but <laughs> you and a sticker. <laughs> Come find me later. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, I, guess this, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I threw this in last minute because I think it's a really cool story. But they both run algorithms that really push the limit of the memory that's available to them. So with the video game graphics, um, yeah, this is a story actually of um, Jared Simpson. He's a principal investigator at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research where I used to work. I'm, I didn't run this by him that I was gonna tell his life story. So I, I hope that's okay with him. I'll ask for forgiveness later. But he was a video game developer at Entertainment Arts and he was writing games for the PSP and he was um, making these crazy worlds with shadows and 3D graphics and fitting them all um, to use 64 megabytes of memory. Um, then he heard about this problem that we have in genomics with de novo sequence assembly. So I don't have a slide to demonstrate what this looks like. So you're going to have to use the power of your imagination to sort of <laughs> understand how it works. But so DNA, A, T, C, G are these bases. And that goes on for three billion, three billion and a half base pairs. That's your whole sequence. So we used to sequence or like read the DNA by just going one at a time, saying first A, then T, then G, and so forth. But they found it was way faster if you copy this whole three billion uh, genome, just copy it a bunch of times, then cut it up randomly into tiny pieces, and then just in parallel read each one of those, maybe like 100 base pair long sequences, and then just let the computer handle it later. So the, the assembly is that assembly part where the, the computer has to figure out an, all these tiny 100 parts and turn it into the three billion genome that we have. So, Back, um, back when Jared was yeah, writing video games, he heard about this problem, and the amount of memory we were using was really limiting how much analysis we could do. So he's like, oh, I know how to write algorithms that use very little memory. So that's what got him interested there, and now he's a cancer researcher. So um, yeah, the point of the story is, you guys have skills that are really useful in science. And I'm gonna talk about a few problems that I think about often. Um, yeah, it's kind of weird with the mic. Okay, you can hear me, right? Yeah. I'm more nervous than I thought I'd be. Okay. <laughs> so one problem um, I used to work on was uh, visualizing protein interactions and in open worm data to help us understand human diseases. So there, there's lots of open worm data around, and that can help us understand life in general. Another problem, I'm just giving you teasers right now, um, analyzing open genetic data to better understand how virus and bacteria interact. So that's E. coli up there. But yeah, we have, we have lots of open data we need to analyze. Another one um, is collecting and curating open astronomy data sets to facilitate data analysis and discovery. I threw this one in because I really think stars are cool. <laughs> and I thought that's a cool picture. I do not know anything about astronomy. But they also have data problems. So yeah, these are usually tackled by academics, sometimes with very little computing backgrounds. And again, I think you guys are the people who know how to solve these problems. So 
This talk is really about open science. I know I titled it the democratization of science, and I think that's one of the outcomes of open science. But I'm really excited to tell you all how you can get involved in this movement. But first, what does open even mean? So we see this word thrown a lot. <laughs> There's open source, open access, data, standards, government, science. And I think it's starting to lose some of its value. At least for me it is, like over time. It just, it's just another word. Um, I think when I first heard the word open science, I thought it meant like free science, like free as in speech. It just made no sense to me. But um, I want to spend a little bit of time just looking back to see how this term came to inspire so many movements and sort of get some of that power and meaning back into the word open. So I would argue that a lot of the fundamental ideas behind openness today actually originates in da -da -da, science. <laughs> so welcome to the scientific revolution. That's King Louis XIV. <laughs> and it's the Royal Academy of Sciences being presented to him. But around this time, the scientific revolution, there was a lot of discoveries happening, and they realized they needed a platform to share and collaborate on research if they wanted to keep moving human knowledge forward. So in came the first academic journal devoted to science, the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. So in case that's confusing, philosophical was natural philosophy, which is roughly equivalent to science today. But the Royal Society of London established that. And this guy, Henry Oldenburg, he was their first secretary. So he actually wrote a series of letters, which gives us a bit of insight into why he created the first journal for science. So here's a quote from him. Uh, we must be very careful as well of registering the person and time of any new matter as the matter itself, whereby the honor of the invention will be reliably preserved to all posterity. So that makes sense. You need to write things down and give people credit for it so that we can build on that. A couple other quotes from him. All ingenious men, and I would add, and women and other people there too. That's okay, he's Oldenburg, it was a different time. <laughs> All ingenious men will thereby be encouraged to impact their knowledge and discoveries. So he's encouraging people to share what they've learned so that we can iterate on it. And then participation, uh, being first revised by some of the members. He understood that more eyes make things better. And when more people see it, um, yeah, we have better results. So science really embraced a culture of working together and sharing discoveries to further human knowledge. So we learn things about astronomy. I don't actually know what this teaches us about astronomy, but I thought it was a really cool gift. We understand how white blood cells chase after bacteria. Oh, it's going to eat it soon. There, oh, it's so cool. And those are the red blood cells. We understand that. The human body is so cool. And this one uh, has a special spot in my heart. So I used to work on, on worm base, which studied um, C. elegans. So this is the first multicellular species ever completely sequenced. So we know the genome for it. And so many people have studied this in, to understand life. Like we understand how this goes from one cell to the exact 980 something cells. So we know its entire development. We've mapped out the entire neural network. So a lot of people use this organism to study life. And a lot of people share the data that they have there, which is really great for science. So fast forward to today, now that we have the web and free software, there's a new meaning of open, I think. So some ideas about, about working open started to come around the 90s. So Eric Raymond published an essay, and I found this picture on Flickr. I thought it was really cool. I didn't read all the words, though, so I'm not sure if it's accurate. But <laughs> he published an essay called The Cathedral and the Bazaar, where he compared two different methods of working um, on free software. So first was the cathedral, where a select group of people would build something together and then in the end release it. So cathedral is still a public space, but um, only some people have a say in what happens. He compared that to a bazaar. I've actually never been to a bazaar, so um, I think this is how they work. <laughs> but anyone can go and just set up a shop. You can negotiate your price. Um, the way you participate in a bazaar is very different than in the cathedral. So he was saying that the bazaar, where people um, have a say and can do things that was more like what was happening in Linux. So I'm going to read a quote from the essay. He says, Linus Torvald's style of development, release early and often, delegate everything you can, and be open to the point of promiscuity came as a surprise. No quiet, reverent cathedral building here. Rather, the Linux community seemed to resemble a great babbling bazaar of different, differing agendas and approaches, out of which a coherent and stable system could seemingly emerge. So he saw this bazaar, and he saw that it was better. More eyes made it better, and more people participating. Um, 
yeah, something came out of it. So this essay actually inspired the release of the Netscape browser suite as free software, which was the basis of the Mozilla project, who I work for now. And that actually sparked the label open source. So Mozilla, if you guys remember the early 2000s, where IE was just dominating the browser market, Mozilla was able to bring together some people on this tiny open source project and create something that really disrupted the market and changed how we interact with the web. So Mozilla likes to embrace the idea of working open, not just in software, but in everything we do. So this is the definition from our wiki, um, that working open is public and participatory. This requires structuring efforts so that outsiders can meaningfully participate and become insiders as appropriate. And I think that at one point, this was true for science. Anyone could really participate and take a part of these discoveries that were going on. Um, but it's a little different in science today. So this is my fictional example. It's not at all based on any of my friends in science. But <laughs> so this is Greta, the grad student. I'm great at naming my fictional people, by the way. She goes to Strange Loop University. <laughs> and she studies this bacteria called Strangest Loop I. <laughs> I think people do functional programming when they're infected. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, she wants to study this um, bacteria from a population in West Africa. So she gets some samples. I'm not, not sure how you get them. Um, she got them somehow. But now it's time to sequence it, so read the DNA that's behind it. And she got 250 strains from that population. It's at around $100 per strain. She spends $25,000 sequencing all that. But then she has this one special strain, S. lupi SDL, which she wants to really understand better. Um, so if you remember when I was talking about sequencing earlier, how they chop up the genome and then read it. So there's a special sequencer now, PacBio, where they chop it up, but now the reads are like 7,000 bases long instead of just 100. So that's more expensive, though. So she spends $5,000 on that one strain to do it. So now she has a ton of data. She's sequenced a lot. She knows the DNA. And she's pretty happy. So she goes to her first meeting, the S. lupi International Meeting. There's a lot of people studying this bacteria. She meets some other people. <laughs> I'm not sure why they all look alike. But <laughs> women in STEM, yay, good job, Greta. <laughs> but Greta discovers that two other research groups, they also sequence the S. lupi STL strain using that special PAC bio. So they're, they're using the same data, but that means there was at least a $10,000 savings they could have had if they had shared their data. And plus the cost of the PacBio machine itself, that's like $700,000. Although the universities probably would have bought it anyway, but still, they could have shared. She also meets Tucker. He's also studying S. lupi in West Africa, but they're a little scared of being scooped, because in academia, the first person to publish an idea or a finding, they, they get the credit for it. And so they're both studying, so they're kind of in competition, so they don't want to share too much. That's OK. Um, oh, yeah, so resource loss, knowledge loss. And they could have shared that data, honestly. So another, yeah, 25K lost. But Greta, it's time to analyze her data. So it's great. She has lots of data that's hers. She didn't share. But she's actually never written code. She did her undergrad in biology, where they memorize taxonomies, they s sit in labs for hours, but they never have to use code. So she spends six months teaching herself Python and bioinformatics just to make some sense of all this data she has. And it's immense amount of data, and it's just getting more and more as our sequencers get better. Um, so both Greta and Tucker actually have the same problem, and they're independently teaching themselves Python, and they write very similar code to run on their same data sets. But no one actually teaches them that there's a Python library that does all this for them. <laughs> they just, no one says so, because they're, they're learning by themselves. It's not in their knowledge. So yeah, there's software loss, because maybe one of them did it better than the library, but they don't share this with anyone. Um, and then time loss, because they have to spend a lot of time rewriting things that already exist. But Greta does get some good results from this. She realizes there's a potentially dangerous strain of S. lupi in West African populations. So that's really great. It's new knowledge. So she can publish this. So she does. But um, so this is a comic from John McKiernan. His daughter is actually a, a big open access advocate. He runs like Open Conscious, one of our community members. But to publish in academia, you actually have to pay to be put in the journal, which is a little backwards from what we have in the rest of the world. Um, but then also, if you want to 
pay, um, if you want it to be an open access article, so if you want it not to be behind the paywall, you have to pay even more. So yeah, and your firstborn child, which is a little crazy. <laughs> and I think in nature, it actually costs about $5,000 to have an open access journal, or yeah, an open access article there. And that's far out of the reach, after, especially after spending so much money on sequencing and everything else. But Greta gets published in a high impact journal. So high impact just means it's um, a lot of readers and a lot of people cite it. She's excited, so she gets this prestigious fellowship because she published first. Um, I didn't put a slide here, but bad news for Tucker, he found the same thing, but he was just a few months too late. So he, he probably gets published in a lower impact journal, and he might have a crappier job, I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe he leaves academia. <laughs> but her research is actually paywalled, since she didn't want to pay that extra $5,000, um, and it's inaccessible by that West African community that she studied. So they don't take the preventative measures, um, to handle the dangerous strain of S. lupi and an outbreak happens. So here's another comic by uh, John McKiernan about just what it feels like to be behind a paywall. Like all the research you need is, is just gone and separate from you. So that was a fictional story, but this happens. Here's the, a couple articles. We were warned about Ebola. The recent Ebola outbreak, there were studies behind paywalls that um, showed that the antibodies for Ebola were present in 10% of the population back in the 80s. So people really could have taken these measures long beforehand, but no one who was actually working there had access to this or knew about it. So it's a real problem today. So we have loss of resources, loss of software. I guess that's also a resource. Yeah. Loss of time. And finally, loss of lives. So I called this talk the democratization of science. And that's why I will fight for democracy. My friend told me to put this slide in. OK. Where we see open science today. But it's not always like that. We do see open science happening. We do see people collaborating. So back to those earlier problems I showed you. There's the visualizing protein interactions in open worm data to help us understand human diseases. So um, I'm going to try. I didn't mirror my screens. Let's see if. Ah, here we are. So this is worm base. I used to work uh, for this. So they actually just collect all that information in C. elegans, that model organism I was telling you about earlier. And so many researchers come here to learn more about what's happening there. And we can see here, sorry, it's, can I zoom in? Yeah. So this gene here has an ortholog in humans that's a, it's present in neuro neurodegenerative disease. So if we can see how this gene, the protein it codes, oh no, it's gone. There you are. We can see how it interacts. So this is actually using a cytoscape library. Oh, my screen doesn't like it. Anyways, we can see how these proteins are interacting with each other, and this might give us insight into why that disease happens, or yeah, how we can help that. Back here. So I'll just, yeah, here's a screenshot of it, since I couldn't show you really. But that helps, helps research a lot. Um, here's a quote about Wormbase. It says that Wormbase is the glue that holds a C. elegans research community together. Many in their field start the day with a cup of coffee and Wormbase. For many, Wormbase stays open all day on their computer as a constant companion. There's simply no more efficient way to integrate all the new data generated in the field. So this is actually from a, um, a grant proposal, so it's a bit biased. <laughs> but <laughs> a lot of people do use Wormbase, and that's working on this project actually made me realize how important it is to just do something with the open data. Because these researchers, they didn't really know how to code, but just making those visualizations really helped them. They're able to have insights and produce something. Um, another problem, so the second one I mentioned was analyzing open genetic data to better understand how virus and bacteria interact. So this is a fun story I like, actually. It's about one of our community members, Madeline. She's in the, the top left, that, that one is her face. So she's actually a grad student, uh, very similar to Greta. I guess, but she actually got, um, she had open data given to her when she started her master's student, or her master's studies. So she didn't have to go and find it. Um, but she realized that, yeah, she doesn't know Python at all, and she didn't know Perl, or how to analyze her data. So we worked with her um, just to put together an open source project as she was learning. And over time, um, community members, a lot of people were interested in helping her with this project. You can see in the participants. Community members were helping teach her things. And they told her about BioPython, a library that does a lot of things she spent the first six months trying to replicate. 
And they, um, yeah, they told her many things. So the tools like this are really common in, for human data, but not as common for bacterial data. So a lot of people are interested in creating tools that will just analyze this data. So another thing we do at the science lab is just run sprints or hackathons where we bring these scientific projects together and just ask people to work on them. So she was here, and actually Max from um, Cytoscape, the library that created this visualization, they were both there. And it was cool because they worked together, and they actually, um, Max came over and actually made a visualization showing how um, the bacteria and the virus were interacting. So it was really, yeah, it was really cool how they could do this together. So here's a pathway Madeline put together. It's a lot of data munging, and honestly, it's a lot of just like format changing and all the steps that are needed for, uh, for analyzing this data. And for someone who's never, like someone like Madeline who wasn't used to the command line or, or yeah, different like tools, it was really daunting. But for you guys, that's nothing. You can change file formats. Okay, the third problem I talked about earlier was collecting, curating open astronomy data sets to facilitate data analysis and discovery. So this is a project with Dimitri Muna. I think he's at, oh, I forgot where he is. He's, he's an astronomer somewhere in the US. But he made Trillion. And the problem in astronomy today is that um, they have these huge data sets, but no one university can hold all of them. So these astronomers run their experiments, and they put their data up on their university website. Um, but it's hard to do an analysis across all the open data that there is there. So here's um, an excerpt from Dimitri's project. Um, astronomy produces extremely large data sets from ground-based telescopes, space missions, and simulations. The problem is that no one institution can host all this data, let alone have the resources to properly manage it. And the result is that applying analysis against full data sets across the wide range of wavelengths available is either beyond the resources of most astronomers or currently impossible. Trillian will make this simple and straightforward. So he's actually working on, um, yeah, he's trying to set, up, set this up so distributed systems can go and you can run an analysis across the different data sets and, yeah, from a central spot. And all astronomers would do is put up a method and some queries, and then it would give them their analysis. And that would be so beneficial to astronomers. Um, but he's actually looking for volunteers to help him. He, I think he's waiting out for, some, for an astronomer who knows code really well. But I think there's probably someone here in this audience who's always wanted to be an astronomer and is willing to learn all the details <laughs> and context is needed so that they can build this. So here's, a, yeah, this is an image that Dimitri put up. There's a data center, compute clusters, anyways. So there are many more problems like this. And I do want to encourage you guys to jump into these projects. It's not going to be easy. Um, it might feel like this sometimes. Because scientists aren't used to talking to people outside of their field. <laughs> and they like using jargon a lot. <laughs> Sorry, I'll, that was very distracting. <laughs> it's really funny, though. OK. But yeah, I, I think you guys can help a lot. So these are people I told their stories. <laughs> I used the work that they were doing. Um, <laughs> but I hope that you guys like science <laughs> and are excited about what we can do together with science. So the slide is science is for everyone. So if you guys go to mozillascience.org slash volunteer, it'll actually ask you a few questions and just prompt you to, to go to a project that's related to what you're actually interested in doing. Um, or you can go to Mozilla Science slash collaborate just to see all the projects that we're helping. So one of the big programs we're doing is just talking to scientists and just helping them run their projects open source or learn how to use the community. So I, yeah, if you guys jump into these projects, sometimes they might not answer you well or they might not be the best at welcoming you to their project. But please, please try hard. <laughs> Science, scientists are learning, so you can teach them a lot about how to work openly. Um, and especially if you haven't worked on an open source project before, I think this is a great opportunity to do something meaningful and just to volunteer your time in something that's not, uh, not super hard, but it's very interesting problems. I think this is a good place. So thank you. I think that's all I had. Um, were there any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I think your question was your friend works at the EPA, and you're wondering how to how to have them reach out more and like scientific communication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think there's been a lot going on with like Twitter and blogs, and scientists are getting much better at communicating their research as they're doing it, um, instead of just hiding it until they publish. <laughs> but I think a lot of it, you, it's a mindset change. They have to realize that it's, it's better if other people hear about it or if the public hears about it. Because a lot of researchers, they're, they're happy just doing their science, publishing, and then just letting the journalists read the paper and try to translate that back to the common folk. <laughs> But I think we can directly speak to humans. <laughs> oh, that's cool. So there's a TED Talk called Talk Dirty to Me that trains people specifically to do that. I actually haven't read, seen that, so I'll for sure check that out. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, back there. Oh, on the couch. Um, yeah, so is there a lot of pushback from universities to make research public? And sometimes there is, I'm, I'm not going to lie, but other times um, they see that working with other universities at least is very beneficial. Or there's a lot of citizen science projects going on, so see, they can see that engaging the public to generate data for them or collect data for them is really good. So I think there's starting to be a shift. Um, I think a lot of the pushback, it's more, um, yeah, more from senior people, more from people scared of getting scooped or worried about um, getting those high impact publications. I think that's what's holding a lot of people back, but yeah. A lot of people have been collaborating with us, which is cool to build things. All right, is there anything else? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so why can't researchers just publish to the web? Um, some of them are, and it's great. <laughs> but a lot of them, if you want to get that like, prestigious tenure track or the fellowship, you need to show that you, you have these high impact publications in nature or these other places. So it's hard. Um, some people are able to do it without those publications. Um, yeah, so there actually is a journal called the Journal of Brief Ideas which is just like run on GitHub. I think it was made by Arfin Smith and Stuart something. Oh, man. Yes, but it's just on the web. And you just publish your brief idea, and it goes online. And then you get a DOI for it, so you can cite it. So you can say, that this was my idea. I should have credit for it. So the building tools like that that are making it easier to use, it's very much what we're trying to do with the science lab. Um, we're also working on a badges project, because sometimes you have those, um, those papers where you have hundreds of authors, and you don't know who did what. So this way, we're trying to issue badges to the author based on what they actually did. So this author wrote the paper. This author did data analysis. So it's a way of getting credit um, more than just the actual like the impact factor of the paper. But saying that I did data analysis on these five things, it's meaningful. And it shows that you have a skill. I think there was another question. Yeah? Yeah, so PLOS, um, actually that's a fairly high impact journal, and it is open, yeah, it is open access. It does cost money, um, more than a closed access usually, um, but there are ways you can get that paid for. I, yeah, there's, I, I actually haven't published in PLOS, so I'm not sure all the details, but um, yeah, it does cost money. There are some other completely open access. I think the Pure J, you pay a one-time $300 fee, and then you can publish there as much as you like. Um, but it has a lower impact factor. So it's a, it's a trade-off, yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so the question is, do, does the Mozilla Science actually help at all with storing the data? And we don't right now. Um, but that, that is a good point. When I worked at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, um, someone in my lab was trying to replicate an analysis that was done. They had to download um, like a petabyte of data from the UK over here to Canada, 
And then, but it was, it was compact, so then they had to unzip it. So they actually needed like two petabytes <laughs> of disk space to do this. And like that is not feasible for your average researcher to do. So it is hard, but people are, um, there are a lot of efforts, especially with like genomic data. Um, I think there's like the Cancer Collaboratory that's uploading all of these um, anonymized cancer data sets where uh, researchers will be able to just upload their analysis code and then it will run on there and then they get results back. So we're not working s specifically with that, but we are part of that space, helping people. Yeah. <laughs> All right, any more questions? Cool, so yeah, thanks for coming. Um, feel free to come talk to me. I've spent most of the past two days making these slides, so I'm like a little socially deprived, so I'm willing. <laughs> I, I'm ready to talk to people, I'm free now. <laughs> but thank you so much.